Glad you could join us now. The Inspector General of Police, David Asantia Pietu, Director General of BNI, Ambassador Rashid Seydou Inusa, and Chief of Staff, uh, Lieutenant General Obed Aqua, and four others were today saved from seven prison terms as an Accra High Court cleared them of a charge of contempt. Lawyers for the Osu Traditional Council had prayed that the court hand the seven persons prison terms for disobeying the orders of a high court, asking that they stay away from a 172-acre land, which is a subject of dispute between the Traditional Council and the Achimota School. While lawyers or the top security officials had denied knowledge of the order, the legal team for the old Achimotans Association had also argued they were not ordered by any court to stay away from the land. High Court Judge Justice Kweku Akabafo um, ruled the top officials could not be found guilty of contempt since they were not served the order. For the president of the Old Ashimotans Association, Professor Ernest Aite, and headmistress of the school, uh, the court held that it lacks jurisdiction since the supposed order served on them was from the Court of Appeal. A cost of 3,000 Ghana cities was awarded in favor of the association and headmistress of the school. President of the Old Ashimotans Association, Ernest Aite, told pressmen uh, the school expects the state to step in to protect the land belonging to the school. Let's move away from that subject because these people were promised wide-ranging tax holidays by government as a way of cushioning them and boosting productivity. Finance Minister in the 2017 budget outlined the abolition of 1% special import levy and duties on importation of spare parts, among others. But 16 months on, the impact of the proposed tax interventions are yet to be felt by some spare parts dealers at across most popular spare parts hub, Abos Yokai. And here's why. To all of our friends in Abosokai, we will abolish duty on the importation of spare parts. 13 months ago, the Abosiokai spare parts market was thrown into a wild frenzy after government announced it had removed and slashed some taxes on various goods and services. Today, the situation has changed. In a shop half the size of a volleyball court, 38-year-old Yao Opokwa Mankwa and his attendant are rearranging some car parts, which include headlights, windshields, and doors of various types of cars. He doesn't look happy today. Amankwa hasn't seen the impact of a tax reduction on spare parts he sells here at Abosuokai Market. It has had a very little impact on our activity as a business because um, although they have abolished the import duties and other small taxes that were on our product. But the problem we are facing now is with the customs. Because when you bring in your goods and you present invoices to the customs, it is left with the customs to determine how much they will be given to you for you to pay. Okay. For instance, if I pay uh, maybe five dollars for this particular light. Okay. And uh, I present the invoice to customs that I pay five dollars for this act. Customs will tell me that either they will accept my five dollars or they will tell me they think it costs more than five dollars. Okay. So maybe they can present maybe fifteen dollars as the value for this item. Okay. And that is causing a lot of problems for us. Okay. Because you know genuinely you bought this thing for five dollars. Custom is saying that you are paying you bought it for fifteen dollars. And you cannot explain. For him, these interventions have not had any impact on their businesses because of a valuation process spare parts importers go through at the ports. If government would want us to feel the impact of the taxes that they have removed, then we should be able to pay our duties in CD devaluation. They should value all the commodities in cities. Because if I know that I buy one of these lights, then I come and government is charging me 10 cities. I have 1,000 pieces of this. I know how much I'm going to pay. 
So nobody is going to determine how much I should pay. Okay. It should be a thing that every business woman or man should know how much he or she is paying for the items that he drink. But not custom officers alone. For nearly one hour of our stay in his shop, not one client pulled up to make a purchase until our departure. And Yao Mankwa confirms even though some prices have gone down marginally, sales are still low. But my appeal to government is the duty that they value our commodities in dollar is not helping businesses. At least they should let us pay or value all the commodities in cities so that everybody will know how much he will be paying for his commodities. People who come here to buy every day, when they come, what's the sense they get? Do they get the sense that things are relatively less expensive now or...? Before, people were complaining. But now, gradually, things are coming down. We are reducing prices. In February this year, government offered a 2% reduction in petroleum taxes following a 28% cumulative increase in fuel prices since 2017. But those have yet to reflect in transport costs, and Yaomankwa is simply unenthused about it. We have not seen much uh, impact on the lives of the people when it comes to transportation. Uh, transport fares has not been reduced and those stuff, although they have not increased it as we know, but also they have not reduced it. So do you have much more money in your pockets today than you had last year, last two years, for example? Voila. Um, what do you call Disposable cash. <laughs> disposable yeah. cash. Yes, 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 yes. It's like from that time up to today, it, it is having that normal trend. Mm. Mm. It has not been getting much money today than before. Yao is just one of hundreds of spare parts dealers here at Abosil Kain who expects the situation to change for the impact of a tax cut to be felt. An acting chairman of the Spare Parts Dealers Association, Clement Barting, agrees. He we are here to feel the impact, even though. Uh, its implementation has you know, taken place. When the implementation started, we all saw that uh, when we go to the port and we clear goods, yes, the 10% duty uh, was off. So it was quite a, a relief to us. But after the implementation, after I think three months down the line, we saw that uh, we are beginning to pay uh, a bit much higher of port we use to pay, irrespective of uh, the 10% which was uh, abolished. So then we drew uh, the government attention uh, to it. That is uh, notably the custom division of uh, GRE. Yeah, because we, we saw that uh, uh, they are now using some you know, you know, new benchmarks to do the valuation of uh, our duties. And uh, uh, they started the implementation of uh, uh, the 10% uh, abolishment of import duties. Uh, we also reduced our prices, yes, by between uh, 10 to 15 percent. And even currently, currently prices are still uh, being reduced. For engines uh, like uh, Toyota Corolla, this Corolla engine. Now moving on from that, the University of Education Winneba is cautioning its staff and officers to de desist from hiding behind academic freedom to tarnish the image of the university. The university dismissed a recent report by a local chapter of Amnesty International suggesting that the rights of some officers and staff of the university are being abused. The university explains at a news conference on Tuesday all occurrences at the university were done in accordance with the university statutes and cannot be deemed as abuse. Richard Kojunyako was at that press conference and joins us via Skype with more. Richard, who addressed the press conference and why? The press conference was addressed by the acting vice chancellor of the University of Education, Winneba, and he says that the university is subject by the behavior of the local chapter of Amnesty International. According to him, the local chapter of Amnesty International did not come to the university to seek the opinion on the happenings of the university. Uh, according to him, there, there is a lot, uh, there are a lot of things that are happening on the university campus, and before anyone could do any publication, the 
person or the entities need to understand the, the correct situations that are happening before they report on that. In this case, Amnesty International did a one-sided publication without recourse to what the university has to say. Uh, they spoke of um, some dismissal and they, they justified that. The person um, went contrary to the statute of the university, and so the person had to be dismissed. They also talked about the vacation of post and some transfers. And according to them, all of these things were done within the remit of the statute and the rules of regulations of the university. So they do not understand why people should come from an uninformed position and decide to turn in the image of the university. He alluded to the fact that the university has a population of about 60,000 um, students with the staff strength of about 3,000. And things are going on in the university despite the happenings, the legal battles and others, the other things. They said that some of the issues that ought to be addressed are currently pending before the court and they will not make pronouncement on it. They mentioned especially the names of um, Professor Avian, so the former Upper West Regional Minister, and who is the principal in terms of education at the University of Cape Coast. They also mentioned Dr. Bequin and then Dr. Atintoni. These are persons the university uh, management says that they have decided not to agree or not to make the present min uh, administration or um, uh, the current um, executives of the university, they, they decided not to uh, bring any peace to these, place, uh, these people, and they have given them fair hearing. And despite the advances, uh, Professor Abia in for instance, is still at post, and he's still the principal in terms of education at the university. And so they do not understand why people should be hiding behind um, academic freedom and be spewing what is not correct or what is not um, really true. Okay, Richard, so from what you're telling us, the Amnesty International report was sparked by the actions taken against these persons you've named. Some of them, uh, they said that they are court decisions and one person um, got uh, some fellowship outside the university to pursue a course. But before the person could do that, the person would need to secure approval from the university before he can be granted um, um, that, that opportunity. In this case, um, Mr. Atintonu or Dr. Atintonu did not get the approval from the university and then he vacated his post. And that cannot right. be deemed as a human rights abuse. In case of uh, Dr. Bequin, he was invited by the University Disciplinary Council to appear before them. Four times he failed to uh, mm. appear before them. And so hence uh, his dismissal. And other, 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 other um, opportunities right. that, that were also offered him. So, Richard, after the university made this statement, what has been the reaction uh, from the university staff or the officers? Well, it, is, it, it will be insightful to note that um, all the council members were present at this um, press conference. The professors at the university were also present. And one thing I will also add is that, you know, recently the pro vice chancellor of the University of, uh, university of Cape Coast also made some pronouncements and suggestions that the, from the way things are going, the university um, council should be dissolved and then the acting vice chancellor should be asked to step aside uh, in what he says was um, something that happened at the University of Cape Coast they should, um, some years ago in the 1980s. And so the University of Education should take a cue from that. And he was right. advising government to dissolve these two factions mm. to uh, bring some peace to the campus of the university. But, but um, mm. when we spoke with some of the members and the principal officers of the university, they said that the pro vice chancellor of the University of Cape Coast did not really clearly understand okay. what was going on at the university. And so he came from an uninformed position, uh, thereby uh, making what he said. I mean, they, they said that it is unfortunate that should be coming from okay. an alumnus of the University of Education. Really. Thank you very much, Richard Kojunyako, for that detailed report. Now, let's move to other parts of the country because uh, the Agotime Ziope District Chief Executive Dixon Jope has warned residents in his jurisdiction against the smuggling of government subsidized fertilizer to neighboring Togo. According to him, smuggling of the fertilizer would impede the prospects of government policies and programs in the agri sector. Mr. Jope gave uh, the warning in Agotime Afegame uh, during a community engagement. About 5,000 farmers have been registered under the Planting for Food and Jobs program with 4,797 bags of NPK and 1,639 bags of urea fertilizer supplied to the district. 
all bags of the urea fertilizer and 4,757 bags of the NPK were distributed to 1,200 farmers who met the requirements, leading to increase in yield. Emmanuel Lai is the Agotimus Geoffrey District Director of Agriculture. OPPB. Normally the yield is around between 1.2 to 1.5 tons per hectare. But 20, 2017, because of the price of food and jobs, those fields that were not affected, we have over 2 point, between 2, 2.2 to 2.5 tons per hectare. Then for the hybrid, after the hybrid, it, it, it's not common, common here anyway. But, but, but when we did it yesterday, we had over 3.5 tons per hectare mm -hmm. for, 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 the, for the hybrid. However, rumors of smuggling fertilizer to neighboring Togo threatens the prospects of the planting for food and jobs programs in the district where about 80% of its livelihood depends on agriculture. Though no one has been caught smuggling fertilizer, the interrelationship between residents and border communities in both countries makes it difficult for authorities to identify persons engaging in the illegal act. In this vein, the district chief executive, Dixon Jokbe, indicated the assembly and border securities had intensified surveillance, hence anybody caught smuggling subsidized fertilizer would not be spared. Me to a uh, border. You are not restricted from using the fertilizer on your farms in Togo, but when you are seen transporting five or ten bags across the border, officials will question bags. you. Five bags. Traditional authorities have pledged their support to ensure the fertilizers are not smuggled but used for the intended purpose. Fed Kwame Asari, Joy News, Agotime Afegame. Still watching Joy News today, I am Daniel Daze. Stories gone by so far. Court clears Inspector General of a Police, BNI boss, and six others of a charge of contempt. The eight were charged for disobeying the orders of a high court, asking them to stay off a 172-acre land, which is a subject of dispute between the Osu Traditional Council and the Achimota School. And still to come, lawyer for Hajia Fati apologizes on behalf of his client for slapping and punching the mouth of an Adom FM reporter at the MPP headquarters last Friday. Meanwhile, Ghana Police Service says it is having a challenge in finding the persons who assaulted Joy News' Latif Idris as they prepare uh, to receive the outcome of investigations by close of this week. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us. Now, lawyer for Hajia Fati, the staunch NPP member who has admitted to slapping an Adom News reporter, um, has apologized to that reporter, Sechua. Hajia Fati slapped and punched Sechua on the mouth for allegedly taking pictures of her at the NPP headquarters without permission. Well, um, lawyer Obri Buahin agreed to join us in studio. We'll um, try and get him before the bulletin is over or later in our subsequent bulletins. But meanwhile, a uh, director at the Police Public Affairs Unit, ACP David Oklu, says um, the, the service is having difficulty in identifying personnel of the service who brutalized Latif Idris at the headquarters over a month ago. He, however, says the outcome of investigations will be presented to the service by close of this week. Hannah Odami joins us uh, via phone because she has been speaking with Mr. David Eklu. Uh, Hannah, what more has Mr. Eklu been saying? No, that's why I told Hannah, if you can hear me, uh, how, what more has ACP David Eklu been saying? Yes, so I went to his office and he said that uh, the report is being handled by PIP currently. That's Police Intelligence and Professional Standards Bureau. And by the end of this week, we are likely to have the report on what happened last week. But the one thing he made clear is that information he's receiving from him suggests that we've not been able to identify the police that hit Lati. But then he can't confirm until he sees it, just that he has heard 
that is what we may have in the report. That's one of it. Also, he suggested that we can go to the cantonments with relative launch um, the complaint to ask for the status of the report currently because it's been more than a week. And once you report the incident to the police, after a week, you can go and find out the status of it. We'll have all the information. And the, the sooner you will get it, depends on what, how far the police have gone with regards to investigation. So Latif can go get that information himself for him to know where the status of the report is. With regards to, uh, when I move to charity, what's happened also, he says that the police have a duty to protect everyone. And so they know that charity has reported and they followed up on it today. And Charity was issued with a medical form, and she's yet to present the medical form to the police. And so as and when they receive it, they'll continue or start those investigations also and ensure that all journalists, as well as all Guineans, are protected. Daniel. Hannah, what you're telling us uh, that Mr. David DeClue has been telling you is that in spite of the fact that Hajja Fatih has admitted to punching Charity in the face, the police still need a medical report from her? Yes, he says that the medical report is necessary. It's needed because she's been issued, and so she has to come with it. It's part of the investigation. They need okay. it to also facilitate the investigation. They can, they can go ahead, but then they need that as part of their investigation. Documented that indeed she was slapped and it's been confirmed by medical personnel, and then they will add it to their investigation. Thank you very much, Hannah Odame. She's our reporter who has been speaking with ACP David Aklu, the director of the Police Public Affairs Unit. Let's stay on the issue of abuse of journalists because the multimedia group has released a statement uh, concerning the attack on charity um, situa um, at the NPP headquarters on Friday. And I have the statement here with me. It's captioned, uh, the statement of appreciation to all media houses for their solidarity with multimedia in the wake of the assault on two of its staff. It begins by reading, management of the multimedia group has taken note of the support and solidarity from the public and in particular the media fraternity following the needless attacks on two of our reporters, Latif Idris and Charity Akosia Sechua. Since Latif was attacked by the police and Charity at the MPP headquarters by a known party activist, Hajia Fati, the Multimedia Group has taken the following actions. One, made a formal report to the police for investigations into the cases and our next line of action will depend on the outcome of the police investigations. Two, made a formal complaint to the leadership of the MPP in the case of Charity Sechua. Three, petitioned the information minister to ensure safety not only for multimedia journalists but all journalists in the country. And four, we have also written to the National Media Commission for its appropriate action. We condemn any form of attack on any journalist anywhere, and we stand together in this fight. It also says, we appreciate the solidarity from all our colleagues in the media. This is important for the, for the sustenance of our pursuit for broader freedom of expression. We must sustain this campaign to ensure that journalists anywhere in this country are not subjected to this kind of abuse in discharge of their duties. Final paragraph says, on behalf of management, I wish to thank the Ghana Journalist Association, the Media Foundation for West Africa, the Despite Group, and City FM uh, for the massive support of the massive show of support and all other media houses that have solidarized with us. We also want to thank the chief executive of the Ghana Chamber of Telecoms, Mr. Ken Ashigbe, for his support for zero tolerance for violence against journalists. This statement was issued for and on behalf of the multimedia group by Ken Ansa, Chief Operations Officer, and Santok Singh, uh, Managing Director, Multi TV. Now let's stay with the subject because in a related development, former Managing Director of the Graphic Communications Group and a media rights activist, um, Ken Ashigbe, is calling on journalists to support each other to end brutalities against them. Journalists, he says, should use their constitutional and professional power to ensure that anyone who attacks them is dealt with. The chief executive of the telecommunications chamber says a team of lawyers are on board to help journalists 
in this course. He was speaking on PM Express last night. What have we done to politicians? What have we done to the military? What have we done to the police? Even there are times when you go to court and then it's the suspects, you know, formerly who attack journalists. There are times when it is pastors who gang up. What do we do? After a while, you find out that the same day that has happened, another media house will be giving audience to all of these people. But if it gets to a point where we decide that this is gone enough, we are not going to allow this thing to happen. Anybody who touches us, we too would use the power that we have, the constitutional power that we have, the moral power that we have, the you know our professional power that we have to ensure that this does not continue. And that's very important. The first thing for me is that the journalists themselves, we tend, you tend to to be the cause of your woes. Mm. When these issues happen, you don't find yourself even supporting it. There might be a journalist that is being beaten. Either it's out of ignorance or for lack of support. You don't even find the other media houses, camera being turned on to be able to collect evidence. You know, so some of these things are critical things that the media needs to be championing. I've, dis I've started collecting, pulling together, you know, some lawyers to be able to support this course. You know, when Latif's issue came and today, and some of the, some of, you know, I mean, the information they're giving us is very insightful to the extent that even the ability for journalists to be able to garner evidence when these things happen to be able to then help in prosecution we don't know and so there's some training that needs to be done so media owners collaboration with GGA various organization this uh, team of lawyers we need to all come together and start training ourselves so that we can hold people accountable for the things that they do against us so it's important for the, the journalists themselves to also start realizing the power that we have and that power is not only directed at the concerns of others it's also directed at the concerns of yourself so we continue in our call for justice for Latif Idris and for charity Akosia Sechua. Let's move from this subject and at least four people are reported severely injured from a crash which has left two vehicles completely mangled. Witnesses say a vehicle suspected to be a national security vehicle on top speed flew into a number of cars ahead of it on the highway. All five vehicles have since been towed to the Tesano MTTD, while personnel from the department are ensuring the gridlock is managed. Join us as Komla Adon visited the scene and reports. It's a heavy, heavy, heavy vehicular congestion on the N1 stretch, and this is as a result of an accident which we are told happened around 6.30 a.m. or 6 a.m. today. Uh, involving a vehicle uh, believed to be a national security vehicle and four others, a taxi, a salon car and then a four-wheel drive. So we are told by some of the witnesses that at this exact spot, the uh, vehicle support, suspected or believed to be a national security vehicle, uh, some assaulted and then crashed into some other vehicles that were in front of it and uh, the accident caused some injuries to some of the occupants of all these vehicles. We understand that the ambulance service uh, you know, was here with a vehicle to convey some of the injured persons to the hospital. We also told that by police that since the accident happened, the traffic congestion has been incredibly insane on this particular stretch. Vehicles can barely move. So usually on this stretch, it, it could take you uh, maybe 20 to 30 minutes to navigate this particular stretch uh, from Aquitaman and La Paz to my left, uh, right to Jowulu and uh, Tetequashi right ahead of me. So I can see blood stains splattered all over the pavements. The median here in the center of exactly where the accident happened. You can see the, the broken glasses. You can see the uh, broken windshield of some of the vehicles and the tail and the headlights of some of the vehicles splattered all over. And this has caused huge, huge vehicular congestion. Let me speak now to Alima. She works around here. Intimidated 
into a bob bag when I'm in the Sabia or Munina, Mewu, and I'm a journey call inside. Into me journey call inside, and I'm a bye, Bedjana, or Nami Ho say, Nipa four, and I'm a prop, a war, and in sa, and I'm in nine, Tikanina says, say. Okay. So all she's been saying is that uh, the accident happened in the early hours of today, that's Tuesday. Uh, a vehicle, you know, somersaulted from here and rammed into several other vehicles that were in front of it. Four people, she says, uh, have been injured, and she saw at least four people injured with, you know, various degrees of injuries, their arms, their legs, and she confirms that two of the vehicles were completely mangled. In Tame how long did it take for uh, police officials and now ambulance mm. to come here? Ambulance, there, I mean, ambulance more by a CSC, best six more, your trains are some by Banamun by a best seven more, Sana, the police from by and on battery car no coy. So she says she didn't see any ambulance vehicle here, but uh, about an hour after the incident, she saw police officials uh, from the Tesano MTTD arrive here to uh, begin to ensure that the traffic situation here is properly controlled to avoid a chaos. And see, uh, on my paper, the police nearby know what happened to the injured persons. Do you know? There be a police from my mom, my mom was just a green green form. I'm not me home, so I'm not a lot of crying on them. I'm not proper there. Me beside him, come from the most remote of Mwako Hospital. Okay, but minimum hospital in Kwao Mwako. Okay. So she she tells us that the injured persons, um, as she is aware, have been taken to the hospital, but she cannot confirm which health facility exactly they have been taken to. So that's Alima. De uh, she works around here. She uh, saw exactly what happened around six o'clock today. So that's the story here at the Akwetima junction of the N1 stretch. And that's also as a result of the accident that happened here. Still watching Joy News today, I am Daniel Dazi. Thanks for staying with us so far. Uh, up next is Business with Imano Abwajiriafi.